So I'm Marie Burns. I've met most of you, but maybe not all of you. I do outreach and senior adult ministry and a little bit of this and that and the other uh, here at Trinity. And I'm going to be bringing you James chapter 2 today, and then you'll have Becky back next week, and then you'll have me two weeks in a row to wrap us up. So um, if you liked Becky, she'll be back next week. And (laughs) And if you didn't, she'll only be back one more time. And I hope you like me because you get me three times, so you get us both three times. Let's open with a word of prayer. Gracious God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time that you've given us to come together in your name. I pray, God, that as we dig into your word, that you will open our hearts and minds to see your word proclaimed to us, that we may apply it to our lives, and that we may then take it out to the rest of the world. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. All right. So James chapter 2 has that fateful statement in it that everybody at some point in their life wrestles with. Faith without works is dead. But before we get to faith without works is dead, uh, we are going to unpack the first section because that shows up later. And I'm going to show you along the way where both sections, while seemingly different, are actually connected. So let us dive right in and talk about faith that we proclaim versus the faith that we act out. I'm going to break it down into chunks, and we're just going to start with verses 1 through 7 of James chapter 2. I'm reading out of the ESV, although I will occasionally jump over to Matthew. If you want to stick your finger in Matthew chapter 5, we'll go back and forth. Um, But I will also pick up Matthew in some other places, and when I do, don't worry about flipping. Just listen, and I'm going to read it to you so you don't have to flip back and forth like that. Uh, But James chapter 2, I'm going to start with verse 1 and go through 7 ESV. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones, the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? So in verse one, immediately you get a, you, you get a hint as to what's going on because right away he references who they worship, which by the way, this is one of only about two or three spots where James actually mentions the name of Jesus. Other than this and maybe one other spot, you don't actually hear Jesus' name. The rest of the references are specifically to God. But of course, we are a people of Trinity, are we not? So he says immediately, you claim to worship Jesus. What did Jesus do with his life? He gave up his sovereignty on the throne or he gave up his uh, exalted place on the throne to lead a very humble, poor life. He was an itinerant pastor, for heaven's sakes. He had no money. He gave up everything to lead a poor life. So simply by pointing out who Jesus was, he's saying, I think you might be doing something wrong here. And in my version, he makes the statement, show no partiality as you hold faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. But in some of your versions, he may ask a question. Hear the version out of NRSV and see if you hear a difference. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? The question sounds harsher to me than it does the statement. The question seems much more cutting. And one of the commentators says, I think he's trying to shame them into understanding they've done something wrong here. Whereas the statement seems to have a little more room for grace maybe. We believe in God, but don't we all have a blind spot somewhere or that one little sin that comes back to haunt us over and over again, things that we have trouble giving up. So I feel like the statement kind of leaves a little room for grace, whereas the question is a little more cutting. Both of them are getting to the same point, and it's what you're going to see throughout this entire chapter. What you say with your mouth and what you do with your body need to go together in order to have true saving faith. And then he goes on in 2 through 4, 2, 3, and 4, to to lay out 
the situation. This could have literally happened. This could have been something that was specifically happening in places of worship or gathering. Or this could be maybe a caricature of something that was going on, but he had a point he needed to make to them. And so he lays it out for them, how you're treating the poor man versus how you're treating the rich man. And so immediately, I I hope you picked up on um, one statement he made that's going to come to us. I'm going to grab Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. We're back to the Sermon on the Mount, and we're in the Beatitudes. Chapter 5, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There are two meanings that come out of being poor in spirit. You can mean somebody who recognizes their sinful nature and the need for Jesus Christ. And then you also have the materially poor who knows I don't always know where my next meal is coming from if I don't have faith in Jesus Christ. So I think James is going more for the second definition here, but I think both are true for what Jesus is saying in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus often refers to the poor in his teachings. One specific one I can think off the top of my head is he's saying when you are, well, this is actually Old Testament and New Testament, it comes up. When you're harvesting your fields, don't go over it twice. You leave some behind, and this is for our widows and our poor to come along and have something to eat. You always care for the marginalized. And he often laments, laments the blindness of the educated. They think they know so much, they can't listen to Jesus. They miss out on the teaching. He often speaks to the poor because their minds are more open to what he has to say. So we know Jesus has a heart for the poor, so should his church. He often elevates the poor. So should our church. So why, as a follower of Christ, would we place the wealthy on a pedestal? And I have, uh, you can just listen if you like, after, out of Matthew chapter 25, where Jesus gives a specific talk about the poor and how we should treat them. I'm reading out of Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. I hope you're hearing that blessed are the poor in spirit for there's the kingdom of heaven. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked for me and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Jesus is saying, when you take care of the poor, you have cared for me. And he goes on and addresses the people on his left, the goats, who did none of these things. Because when they saw the least of these, they ignored them. And so Jesus is very specific. So if it's if you want to be mad at anybody about the teaching, you got to be mad at Jesus because that's where Jesus, that's where James is pulling all of this from. These, this is Jesus who has these harsh words. If you don't do it for the least of these, you will be the least in the kingdom. You have to care for the poor. And the church can stand to learn a lot from the poor members, can they not? Jesus named them as the rich heirs, yes. But no one knows more about having faith than the person who doesn't know where their next meal is coming from. They know much about having faith when they trust in Jesus to provide everything. So James is really honing in on this issue. You have to take care of the least of these. Elevate them. Do not elevate the rich. He says in verse 6, But you have dishonored the poor man and not the rich, the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court. We don't have a specific meaning for what that is as far as what the court cases were about. But Jesus does tell us throughout Scripture that you're going to be persecuted for my name's sake. And there are a couple of specific places where he even says, you're going to be arrested 
for my name. It's not about you. It's about me. It's me they're persecuting. And don't worry about what you'll say because the Spirit will guide you. So Jesus does warn his people throughout Scripture that you will be persecuted. And here James is saying it is these the, the rich people that you are putting on a pedestal. They're the ones that are dragging you into court. And Jesus says in uh, back to the Sermon on the Mount, which you don't have to flip, The other place where he promises for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He's saying it to blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's that second place in the Beatitudes where you get that specific promise. So the poor in spirit and those who are persecuted, he's saying you're being persecuted, but you're lifting up the very people who are persecuting you. Don't do that. (laughs) So don't don't elevate them. What James is dealing with is ultimately a major inconsistency between people's stated faith, what they say they believe, and their actions. They are showing favorite, this favoritism that he outlined in 2 through 7. Then They're doing that instead of keeping the royal law of love, which, by the way, in verse 7, I don't want to miss this either, he says they're blaspheming the honorable name by which you were called even more so in New Testament times when they had, most of them had actually seen the resurrected Jesus. When they were baptized, they would invoke the name of Jesus over them. And it had, and I would argue because they had seen it, possibly an even greater meaning because they were becoming the first followers of the Christian faith. They took the name of Jesus upon themselves. They are now a follower of Jesus. So he's saying these people are blaspheming that name that has been spoken over you. This is a problem. These are not the people to be aligning yourself with. So this carries us into uh, verses 8 through 11. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This can be a little bit difficult one to digest. It seems a bit harsh. If you break one law, you've broken the whole thing? Well, yes. Um, This harkens back to, you guessed it, the Sermon on the Mount. After the Beatitudes, Jesus talks about the law. And I'm going to flip over, back over. He picks up in verse 17 and he talks about the fulfillment of the law. He says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So breaking one part of the law breaks all of it. When Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He actually pulls two out of two separate sections of our Old Testament. He pulls out the Shema, Deuteronomy 6. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he pulls from our good friend Leviticus. I love that book. Leviticus 19, and it says, Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus grabs from those two separate parts of the law and pulls them together and says, this is the greatest command. Everything in the Old Testament law can be boiled down to these two things. Love God, love your neighbor. These, by the way, sound like actions to me. You've heard the phrase, love is an action. This is true. If If you're committing adultery, you're not loving your neighbor, also known as your spouse. If you commit murder, you're definitely not loving your neighbor, are you? You've killed them. And Jesus says, yes, this is true. But in that moment, in the Sermon on the Mount, after he says that, he goes on to break down adultery 
and murder specifically, which is what James pulls out right here, which is why we feel like he spent a lot of his time on Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus shows where it's about more than just not committing the action. It's about what you're feeling in your heart. So when you have the Old Testament law, and we talk about this, we did a study on Leviticus a couple of years ago, and I think it's still up on our website. We talked about the sacrificial system of the law and how it was essentially a band-aid for the situation. It could never bring about a full heart change because it was the sacrifice of an animal who knew, knew, who knew no better about the life of a human, right? This is why Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. He became fully man, knew of sin, was surrounded by temptation, but never sinned, and therefore could become the perfect sacrifice that covered all sins. In the Old Testament, there was no expectation of a heart change. You sinned, you did the sacrifice, it was a band-aid, to get by. When Jesus comes as the perfect sacrifice and is raised from the dead and we get the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we now have the opportunity for an entire change of person inside and out because we are now the temple and God dwells within us. So now there's this expectation of a full heart change. We can truly live out, love God, love neighbor. And so all of those commands get boiled down into this. So yes, when you break one aspect of it, you've broken all of it. Because if I sin against you, I've also sinned against God. And if I'm sinning against God, I'm hurting the community around me. Whether I think my sin is secret or not, even secret sin hurts those around you in some way or another. So when you break one aspect of it, yes, you break all of it. And it's a tough pill to swallow for sure. There's one thing that Jesus says at the end of that part of the Sermon on the Mount that uh, some people struggle with, and it's in verse 20 where he talks about your righteousness having to surpass that of the Pharisees. And he's not saying you have to live out all of these little, you know, they had those laws that they made up about you can only walk so many steps on a Sunday and things like that. He's not saying you have to live all these things out perfectly. What he's saying is you must so embody that love that, um, how am I trying to say this? You don't just keep the letter of the law. You now have the spirit of the law within you because you have that love for God and neighbor. So that's how you surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees. It's because you are living out that love through not just your words, but through your actions. It's an entire person change that can happen now. So that's what he means by surpassing the righteousness. It's not about keeping all these little rules. It's about having the fullness of that love in you that you then show to others. Does this make sense so far? Mm -hmm. Okay, before we go any further into this, I want to say, do we have any questions? Because this is a lot to unpack. can seem kind of harsh. Okay, so he says in verse 12, So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without, for judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This also seems harsh. Here we go again with James. He's not pulling any punches. Jesus shows us mercy first, does he not? He extended salvation to us and it was up to us to receive it. So the mercy came first. And then God, the Jesus asks for us in some very specific places, um, if you love me, you'll obey my commands, which comes back to, by the way, love God, love neighbor. If you love me, you'll be, obey my commands. But the salvation comes first before anything's asked of us, just like it was, by the way, in the Old Testament, God saved the Israelites out of slavery before he asked the first thing of them. He brought them to safety. He got them out from under that burden of slavery before he asked anything of them. So God is always the same. The grace and the mercy, they come first. And so what he's saying here is you must also show that to others around you. If you expect to be treated with that same mercy, think about the Lord's prayer of forgiving my trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We must also extend forgiveness, mercy, and grace to those around us. Jesus echoes this. If you uh, remember, I won't read it, but in Matthew 18, the parable of the unforgiving servant where the guy owes the debt to the ruler, a big debt. He goes before the ruler. The ruler forgives him the debt, sends him on his way. 
And the first guy he comes across who owes him like maybe 50 bucks, he pulls him by the shirt collar and demands his money when the guy didn't give it to him, he throws him in jail. And then he gets called back in front of the ruler, doesn't he? And he is in trouble for his debt. Jesus is saying, you've been shown mercy. You show mercy to others. If you don't show mercy, don't expect to be treated with mercy when your time of judgment comes. Because we all know that there is some point where thankfully Jesus will also stand as the one who defends us, but we will all come to that point in our lives. So this carries us into the faith without works part. So I'll ask one more time before we head into that, and I'll show you how they're connected, believe it or not. Did it feel disconnected to anybody reading through this? Like you got to verse 14 and we picked up a different book entirely or something? James feels that way but I'll show you that they're actually connected. So we're going into faith and deeds. Um, We'll pick back up on how we treat the poor. He's talking specifically about this group because really all the way back to the Old Testament, God is talking about care for the marginalized, the orphan, the widow. That comes up over and over again. It's carried all the way through. How you treat them is your deeds. So he's still carrying the same idea of what happened at some point in their assembly place of how they treated some people rather poorly, and he's carrying that into this new section. So you essentially need to keep that in mind as you address the deeds. One commentator said it like this, faith working through merciful deeds fulfills the royal law of love to neighbor. So the two sections are connected. And I'm going to take them in pretty small chunks. Let's look at 14 through 17. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So we have a profession of faith, but then only well wishes in the face in the face of need. And his question is, is this true faith? When the churches, especially back then, people were becoming, were were getting baptized. There are a few stories where you see Peter and I think Paul too, go into the church to visit them and say, did you have the gift of the Holy Spirit? And they say, I don't know. We did John's baptism with water and that's it. And then they go through it again with Peter, and I think it happens with Paul, and there's the rushing in of the Holy Spirit, and they're speaking in tongues. They've got that that fullness of the Spirit, and then deeds come out of it, also known as fruits or works. There's other words for this. That was um, the direct action because that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. It stirs us to action, speaking a nice platitude that ignores the plight of the least of these does not bring salvation. This is not a life that has truly been given over to God is the argument James is trying to make here. And then going into verse 18, he picks up an imaginary dialogue partner. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. So his imaginary dialogue partner is trying to separate the two out. I will show you, but James responds, I will show you my faith by my deeds. This references us back to James chapter 1, verse 22. He says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. We must be God's love and peace. We can't just speak it over people. We often hear it said, as I said earlier, that love is a verb. You can't just talk the talk. We must walk the walk. Talk of faith does not bring anything about for those in need. We must show them our faith by our actions. And James views deeds as the fullest expression of our faith. It is the way of the mature Christian. So a Christian, perhaps early in their infancy, it is about God extending the hand of grace and them receiving it by their profession. Yes, it starts that way with words, not deeds. But you simply by reaching out to God, I would submit, is a, is, a, is a deed brought about by a faith of God that can save you. But then it has to grow from there. The faith has to mature from there. Even Paul talks about the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Ha! 
<laughs> Got it. Thank you. <laughs> I had to memorize it a long time ago for a camp. Those things aren't things you just do for yourself. These are ways that you interact with other people. You have that joy. You extend words of peace to others, but you also bring that with you when you interact with someone. Have you ever interacted with somebody that you just felt like had deep-seated joy in their soul and they brought it with them no matter what was going on? They just kind of had that something in them. It affected you. So you bring that to other people. You can't ha- when you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you can't help but bring about good deeds. And so what James is ultimately arguing here, I think, is that if you merely say the words but nothing about you ever changes, then maybe you need to revisit whether you were actually saved. If there's nothing coming out of that, no fruit, you've continued on in your old way of life, sinning, treating others poorly, have you truly been saved? Or are you just talking the talk, but not walking the walk? And he goes on from there to give us two just very opposite examples of what he means. He uses Abraham, the father of the faith, and Rahab, the Canaanite harlot. We go very opposite directions with this. And I think he did that on purpose. I believe he's talking to Jewish people. They would all, of course, know about Abraham, and they all knew about Rahab because it was Rahab that made a way for the taking over of Jericho in the name of God. And so I think he did this on purpose. But let's look at Abraham first, and then we'll look at Rahab. Uh, Chapter 2, verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works, and not by faith alone. Let's stop there and we'll come back to Rahab. This story of Abraham gets brought up by plenty of people all throughout the New Testament, Abraham's faith and Abraham's righteousness. And it's one of the stories that people struggle with the most out of the Old Testament, where God has called Abraham to sacrifice the very son he's been waiting his whole life for. How could God ask him to kill his own son? And It's a tough one to work through, and I don't know that I fully got the answer to this. but I'm going to give it a shot. You see what you think. Abraham did wait his whole life. God extended the grace. He gave him his son. Don't forget that along the way, Abraham tried to make God's will happen. He's got another son that he had before Isaac. That was a sinful way to act, and it was Abraham choosing his wills over God's will. And I think that when God was trying to institute his plan of salvation for all of the world, and he chose to start with one man that would then grow into a family, that would then grow into a nation, and the purpose of the Israelite nation was to bring God to all the rest of us. That was their purpose. That's why God called Abraham in the first place. And so he had given Abraham what he promised, his son, And I don't think God tests us to try to break us. That's not God. But I do think there are pivotal moments in our life where God needs us to say the word yes to him for his plan. I think there are just pivotal moments in our lives where it's up to us, where God says, whom shall I send? And we say, here I am, Lord, pick me. There are points in our life where the yes has to be there, I believe. And so in this moment, God's not testing Abraham to break him. He needs Abraham to make the decision Adam and Eve did not. Adam and Eve were in that garden. They had everything. But God's will was to not eat of that fruit. Or maybe even, I've heard some posited, don't eat it yet. Maybe later. But in that moment, they were told, don't eat from that tree. And they said, ah, but I want to know these things. My will, not your will. And they made the wrong decision that sent us down this whole path. And so I think in that moment where God was ready to move forward with his plan of salvation, he needed Abraham to make the decision Adam and Eve could not and say yes to his will. 
And in that moment, he, can, he is now ready to move forward with Abraham's line to move through his story, his plan for our salvation. Grace then works. Isaac, now I need you to say yes. And in that moment, out of Abraham's faith is a deed, an action. That's why he's the example for James here. He had so much faith in God, he was willing to go through with this action that was born out of his faith. He so trusted God, he was willing to go up on that mountain. He was willing to go to that altar. But if you've read the story, you'll know that they say, where's the sacrifice? And he says, God will provide. I believe Abraham knew all, he was ready to do it, but I also think he had faith enough to know that God's plan was bigger than his, and that's why he could say yes, and God stayed his hand, and so moved forward the story of salvation. That's why I think this is such an important example for James when he's talking to the Jewish people. Look at the father of your faith. He had so much faith that we had an incredible action, an incredible deed, And we're not even asking this of you. We're asking you to treat those around you with dignity and respect and treating ultimately everyone the same, no matter where they come from, no matter what their socioeconomic background, everyone is treated the same. That's why I think he uses Abraham. That's why I think the story of Abraham at that point happened, by the way. Before I move on to Rahab, any thoughts or questions? I think our relationship has to grow. Just like I said earlier, that that maturing of faith. Abraham had been interacting with God for a long time to get to that point. Then you've got Rahab. Verse 25, And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Everybody knew the story of Rahab. Rahab's deeds is what got them into Jericho, into the promised land, and moving about to claim the inheritance that was God's to give to them. And so Rahab, the Canaanite harlot, has maybe faith the side of a mustard seed in her moment. I don't know if, I didn't know this until we started studying Joshua, that I always imagined when God's people were in the wilderness for those 40 years that they were just off in some desolate place where there was lots of sand and nobody else around. But what we learned in digging into the book of Joshua, they interacted with other groups of people all the time. And there were even some skirmishes in the desert. And by the time they got to Jericho, all of the Canaanite land knew about the parting of the Red Sea. They all knew about it. They knew about how with every skirmish, Their God saved them, the Israelite people. They knew about the parting of the Jordan River. That word had spread throughout the land. So Rahab knew who God was, just like everybody else in Jericho knew who God was by that point. And she never had the opportunity to develop a relationship. There was never an opportunity for her to worship God and develop this faith. But she knew enough to know that if she wanted to be saved, she needed to be on the side of Almighty God. And so in that moment, out of that tiny mustard side seed of faith, we have a deed. We have an action that blossomed out of that by taking care of our spies, and then the rest of the story is able to happen. So he uses these two, James does, very opposite examples of faith. The man who has traveled with God most of his life, and the woman, not of Jewish descent, who made a decision knowing just enough about God. Regardless, a deed came out of it. And by the way, out of the line of Rahab, you get the line of David. I don't know if you know that, but Boaz and then David and then Jesus comes out of a woman with a very small amount of faith who made a very big decision. So I know that Paul brings up Abraham. And in fact, in um, I think it's Romans 3 or 4, Abraham, Paul specifically brings up Abraham and says, Abraham was saved by his faith, not his deeds. And it seems like Paul has now gone an entirely different direction as James, and they disagree completely. So if you've read the story and you wonder how the two come together, when Paul is talking about Abraham, he is talking about 
circumcision more often than not, and not about the specific instance with the altar. When you're dealing with the law of the Old Testament, there you can see pretty clearly um, the moral law and the uh, ritualistic law. When you did sacrifices, you had to be ritualistically clean. We're talking clean hands. Now we have clean hearts. We're talking about purified head to toe. Now we worry about purification of the self. This is the difference between now and Old Testament because we're not having to make sacrifices anymore. We've had the ultimate sacrifice. We don't need to look different ritualistically because we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We are now the temple. We're not upkeeping a building. We're upkeeping ourselves. You see how there are some differences there with the ritualistic part? So now that we no longer need sacrifices, we no longer need the ritualistic purification, although Jesus uses a lot of that same language when he talks about purifying the heart, purifying your mind. He uses a lot of the same language, but it's not literal washing your hands anymore. And when Paul is ministering to the Gentiles, he's having to deal with the Jewish people trying to put those things upon the Gentile people such as circumcision, and they wanted them to keep all these other laws. And that's why we had the, the, uh, the council at Jerusalem, uh, somewhere in the middle of Acts. I can't remember anymore now where that was in Acts, where they had to tease apart, okay, what can we ask of the Gentiles who didn't grow up in the faith of the Jewish people? What is reasonable to ask of them? And what is too heavy of a yoke to put upon them? We can let a lot of this go. If the Jewish people want to continue it, as people who have followed God for hundreds upon hundreds of years, that's fine. But it's not something we need to put upon the heads of the Gentiles. And so Paul is constantly having to deal with, don't worry about those kinds of actions, this ritualistic stuff, because God's not asking that of you. He's asking for you to believe with your words and your actions, love God, love your neighbor. He doesn't need you to go through all the ritualistic steps anymore. So when Paul... I think Paul and Abraham are coming at, or Paul and Abraham, Paul and James are coming at the story of Abraham in two different ways. They've got two completely different audiences talking about different aspects of the law with different purposes. Does that make sense? One of the commentators said um, they're using the same language but different dictionaries uh, because they, they kind of cross over some of their language a little bit. But Paul actually even ultimately says himself in Romans 13, 8 through 10, oh no, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder. These sound familiar, don't they? You shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So I think James and Paul agree, but at first blush, they appear to be speaking completely different words. You've got to dig in, get that context, get the audience that we're talking to and dig in and you'll find that they tend to come back to the same place in agreement on everything. That is uh, chapter two of James. I kind of flew through it. How are we doing? Well, I say flew through. It took us 40 minutes to fly. Any questions? These are some pretty big things to unpack. You know, go back to Abraham mm -hmm. and uh, going to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, inwardly, Abraham knew that God was not going to ask him to really make this sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm going to go with you, Lord, on this. <laughs> you know, to a point. But, but I don't think that we're going to get to where you're telling mm -hmm. God. And so I've got faith in you that mm -hmm. you're not going to make me put my son on the altar. Mm -hmm. But if he inwardly knew it, what does that say about faith? I I'm mean, saying, you know, if life. you're giving, you know, mm -hmm. I'm going to do this no matter what, but you think, oh, but he's not going to make me do it. Well, then it's easy to say, yes, I'm going to pull out in front of this car because God's going to stop that next one. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if... Yeah. Um, so I, I think there's a there's a part of that that doesn't fit for me, okay? I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, 
and I'm sure he hoped that was the truth. Well, that's what I really mean. Yeah. 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 Um, I, 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 I have probably he hoped believing that everything was going to be all right. You know, you either have faith, I'm going to go through with this, and I'm doing exactly what you asked, Lord, or you're holding back part of it. And I don't think Abraham did mm -hmm. hold back. It was, a, it was a trust that there was an answer in the midst of some of this. And maybe it was that if I have to sacrifice my son, I, there's, there's a greater reason that I don't understand. Yeah. So, and I, Isaac, the, the sacrifice of Isaac, it's interesting because, like I said, he, Abraham was able to, to make the decision that Adam and Eve could not. He was able to choose God's will. And Abraham is asked to give up. It wasn't his firstborn son, was it? because he sinned earlier on and tried to do things his way instead of God's way. But I do think it's interesting that Abraham was asked to sacrifice his beloved son. I don't think that was a, mis I don't think that was a coincidence. And I think that along the way, you have lots of these almost but not quite moments. Moses actually offers to sacrifice himself on behalf of the people and their, one of the great sins they committed. And God said, no. Thanks anyway, it's not you. It has to be somebody who can perfectly embody what it means to be my created person. And we can only get that through the incarnate Jesus Christ. So I mean, this is where it comes. I was not the reason why I was but to do it. <laughs> <laughs> True. It's 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 all about that faith and it's yeah. hard to explain that kind of faith. But when you live out that kind of faith and you get into that relationship with God where it becomes very reciprocal, you know he's going to carry you through. And every time he does, sometimes he carries you all the way through the middle of the mess and you don't get to cut any corners, but you come out on the other side stronger in your faith because of it. And that peace that implants in you is just something you can't explain to others. You just have to say, trust me, you got to live this out because that peace and that joy that sits there deep even when you've experienced tremendous loss, it's, it's what it's all about. And once when you have those things that you bless others and you see those, those deeds and actions, it's born out of faith. Paul says at one point, um, uh, don't ask me where, it is by grace we have been saved through our faith. It's not of our works so that we cannot boast. And I agree, you, there's nothing you can do to win the grace of God. It has to be God extending his hand and you taking it. But then out of that, that's what James is saying, is, is that if that's where you stop, you'll never grow in your faith. It has to move from there. It has to be, there has to be this maturing of faith there. And when that faith matures, it comes out to everyone around you. There is, there is fruit that comes from that. So he and Paul seem different, but they are very much the same. I think because Abraham had seen God's promise come through in mm -hmm. his son Isaac, that he he was at a different place mm -hmm. than he was when he took the handmaiden and, right. and did all that. Yeah. But going up that mountain as a human, mm. you know what's going through his mind. Oh, yeah. His son is... This son given to him by God is mm -hmm. carrying the wood that is going he's going to have to lay him on. Yeah. And you're you're thinking, God gave me this son. No. Finally, after all these years, he promised this son and here he is. Why would why would he make me do this? Yeah. But his his faith has matured mm -hmm. and he's going to go through the steps mm -hmm. and pray that something else happens. And can't you imagine he's also saying, I've got to go back and tell his mother what I did. No. <laughs> oh, <my goodness. laughs> oh, so true. <laughs> Worse than that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What did she think when he left with Isaac and all this wood? Did she not know why they were going up on the mountain? I don't know. Oh. Well, he might not have told her. It, well, it might have been, you know, they, they took, it was, it was him and Isaac and he took two servants with him and he said, y'all stay here. We're going to go up and make the sacrifice. And it was well, Isaac, you know, I think, who asked days, about that. The man of the house did not tell the lady everything that he was doing. That still happens. 
<laughs> I'm staying out of that. <laughs> Oh boy, yeah. You know, I had always imagined Isaac was very young. But do y'all remember a sermon Doug preached not that long ago that suggested Isaac was much, much older and would have known exactly what was going on and went with him? Yeah. Well, because he I asked. Have. He asked where was the sacrifice. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. And I, Abraham said, God will provide, I believe <laughs> I hope Isaac had the same kind of faith his dad did, because if he didn't, he would have really held this one against him. <laughs> you put me on that altar. The knife was right there. Uh. <laughs> Any other thoughts or questions? All right. Uh, let me close this in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for being in this space with us. God, I pray that as we go from this place and as we continue every day taking steps towards you, that works would be born out of our faith, that we would listen for the places where you call us to act in deed and not just in word. Because in doing that, God, we spread your love to the rest of this world and heaven knows, you know how desperately our world needs you now. So make us the instruments and work through us, Lord. It's in your son's precious name we pray, amen. Mm -hmm.